So, it's very warm today. Um, so in the last part, I looked at the two different hypotheses of where the Indo-European language may have arisen. And I said that I'd done some research to suggest that the mythology was Neolithic. Um, now, in this section, this is a slightly shorter section, I'll just basically talk about how I, how I work this out. Um, in the same way that when scholars have reconstructed the language, that they've seen how languages change over time and they've compared the different branches to suggest how the original language would have sounded, the same thing happens with with a, with a mythology. You can look at different mythological traditions present present in the different Indo-European cultures, and you can tie the motifs together and look at the point of origin to try and work out um, where they started, what the original myths were about. Um, so you know you can look at um, start to look at a date that the that the myths may have originated, what the original meaning was, and and also the location where the, they may have um, started. So to start um, this process, what I did was to um, was create a, a diagram. Um, what I did was to place the Indo-European languages um, in the in the place that they are spoken now or were at least spoken um, in recorded history so for instance Celtic um, isn't spoken now throughout most of France but it was until the, the early Roman period now it's just spoken in sort of Brittany, Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, Old Man, Scotland it's right on the periphery so we're, we're looking at um, sort of how it was, uh, how the languages were, at least before the, the creation of the Roman Empire. So we have the furthest east is Tacarian, which is all the way over here in sort of Tekla Makan Desert. Um, what I then did was to try and um, show how um, uh, the, the different language groups had split. Um, so, I um, at this point I was presuming that Proto-Indo-European was Anatolian. This is a Renfrew hypothesis. Um, it doesn't really matter for the sake of this diagram whether it started there or whether it starts up here in the Russian steppes. It just means we have to move this symbol sort of over either that way or that way, depending which um, which hypothesis you believe. But it doesn't actually change how we believe the, the language trees split. So, for instance, it doesn't affect the fact that the Germanic, Baltic and Slavic all come off one sort of branch of the tree and the Italian and Celtic branch is another. So um, the actual geographical placing of the origin of, uh, of the language doesn't change the way that the language changes. Anyway, um, what I'd done was to, to build up this kind of flow diagram of the, of the different of the development of language. Um, so that when I started looking at mythological images, I could see whether a certain mythological image, say, just appears in this group. If it just appears in the Germanic Slavic group, but not in any others, then I could say perhaps it um, originated after the, the, the general split, the first split. Whereas if you have a motif which is found in Celtic, and is found in sort of the Indian cultures. Um, this suggests that um, it was that that sort of motif was present in Proto-Indo-European times. It's been there from the start. It's not a late comer. And so, this is a reason for putting this 
this table together. I could also, by putting it on a map, I could suggest, for instance, why there were certain motifs in Celtic myth, which were also found in Germanic myth, but weren't in in the sort of Eastern myths, suggesting that we were looking at cultural contact um, in Britain, sort of in the Dark Ages. So there are, for instance, a number of Irish myths and Viking myths, which have really similar similarities down to um, a sort of a, a figure called Ingeld who burns down a feasting hall. Now, this isn't doesn't come from a Proto-Indo-European source. It comes from an old Viking tale, which was then told in, you know, the feasting hall in Dublin and became part of Irish myth. So, you know, the, what this map allows us to do is to look at um, the the proximity of cultures, like, you know, the Latin and the Greek cultures, where we know that there was a great deal of influence from Greek into the Roman world, mythologically, that we can then dismiss as, um, as something that was perhaps present present in the um, Proto-Indo-European world. So really, it's a the whole point of this process was to identify um, mythological motifs by um, looking at the proximity and dating of, of shared motifs and, and getting rid of all the reasons why it could be later influenced um, so that we were looking at patterns which occurred at the core of the myths and were shared and, were, and did come from this proto-Indo-European um, period and not later. So it was quite a, quite a task to, to get to do this. So what I did was to look at each of the language groups and to look at the existing um, mythological tales and cycles that existed for each and then to um, look at how these had developed, whether some were copied off other bits, um, how they changed over time. So it was it was quite a task. But um, this this table here shows the different traditions coming off each of the different language groups. And for those who are interested, I can send you more details of this. Um, but I have lists. Of the different traditions, which I'm just going to flick through now. I'm not going to read them out because it's it's a bit, a bit tedious. Um, so this, these are all the different tales. Um, the size of the disc that the tale occupies shows sort of relative importance. Um, so, for instance, down here, RV is the Rig Veda. This is one of the earliest, um, sort of dates to sort of at least 1800 BC, um, some of these traditions. So that's why th this has got a sort of a huge circle there. So it's one of the most important sources. Whereas we come over to the Irish tradi traditions um, and we have Things like the Toynbo Cooley, Cattle Raid of Cooley, that's quite a large one, but it's but there are other smaller tales which just kind of a kind of later um, some of the tales from the Mabinogion up in Wales. So yeah, I'll just flick through the list and people can pause it if they're interested. Um, so these are the main sources. I use a lot of Celtic sources because um, I was reconstructing um, Indo-European myth as it related to sites in Britain. So obviously I was looking at Celtic sites or sites in Celtic-speaking countries to see whether there was any continuity between the, the old mythological traditions and sort of even earlier Neolithic and Bronze Age ritual sites. So yeah, that's the count.
the Germanic sources, Anatolian, Iranian, Indic, Slavic, Greek. So that's if, if anyone's interested. And so what I would do is I would look at a certain motif. So in this case, um, let's say, I can't remember what one this is exactly, but let's say it's the motif of um, the, the cattle slaying or the cattle, cattle theft. And I would see if I could identify it in certain cultures. So having identified it in um, uh, sort of Scandinavian myth, Germanic myth, with the death of the cow, Aldumla, and then having found it in certain Irish tales, and then Welsh tales as well, and then also appears in a Greek tale. Um, I could then argue that perhaps um, because you know, the motif seems to be more kind of Western European, but its appearance possibly in a Greek tale, um, which comes off this side of the family tree, suggests it may have an earlier um, kind of origin. As you can see, there's also um, other appearances of other motifs which are quite similar. And again, that, these suggest um, an occurrence of this tradition on the sort of eastern spread of the languages as much as the west. So we're perhaps looking at a tradition which does have a, a proto-Indo-European origin, but which has um, sort of changed, differed as it splits. So this is the kind of thing I did. Um, and, and then in the next part, we will go into detail and uh, uh, two main features, the cosmogony, the, the creation and the cattle theft, to really look in detail at when these um, images arose and were they just borrowed from um, neighbouring Neolithic cultures when after the Indo-European cultures had spread or or does it seem to be present right at the start, showing that either there was Neolithic influence right at the start or that the culture was Neolithic from the start? And this is just a discussion from my PhD about the relative complications and difficulties of which sources are, are good and which, you know, just because a source is old doesn't necessarily mean it's the best source. So, for instance, some of the Baltic tales, which come from sort of the 16th, 17th century, um, preserve some of the best, that's AD, preserve some of the best material because mm -hmm. of that language branch is a very conservative one and those cultures were not influenced by other sort of Mediterranean cultures until very late. Whereas some of the earliest sources, like sort of Iranian, for instance, or Anatolian, have been... Um, have been influenced by other cultures for, for, you know, almost thousands of years. So earlier doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, this is just something that I, I had to sort of argue um, for when I was looking at the, at the different mythological um, tales uh, and, and sort of put them in their order of importance.